So how are you enjoying your day today? I'm enjoying it tremendously. What is it that you're enjoying here at the Burnaby Village Museum? I'm enjoying my brand new granddaughter. And uh, I wanted to bring her here to ride the carousel because her great-grandfather uh, worked on it for five years when it was at Happy Land. Oh, Happy Land. So yeah. what year are we talking? Oh, it would have been in the 50s. Um, actually, it would have probably been in the late, about 48, 49 in the 50s. And he ran the carousel. And then right next to the carousel, there was a silver streak. And he had to run between both rides. And it, Happy Land was one of the busiest places in Vancouver in those days. Um, they also had a dance pavilion uh, right off Renfrew. And that was over just, bef just at the beginning of the entrance to Happy Land. Um, if you were a kid in those days in the Van East, you lived at Happy Land. And you had a great time. And I would really like for anybody that remembers any of this to write in and let people know that there's a, some of us still around. Because <laughs> uh, it was an awesome place to be. And Jimmy's, car uh, Jimmy's cafeteria was right on the corner as you walked in. And the smell of fried onions. My mom just, she always said the same thing. Oh, I love Jimmy's cafeteria. Yep, and then that was right, and Jimmy's Cafeteria was at the beginning of all the games. And then you walk down all through the games and past the, the pavilion and the games, and then you came to the shoot the shoot, and the whip, and the silver streak, and the carousel. And uh, for 50 cents, you could have a great time. Yeah, so yeah, times have changed. Takes them a lot more than 50 cents today to have a good time. But I'm sure glad that Burnaby had the wherewithal and the intelligence to take that carousel and, and, and refurbish it because there's a lot of kids that still love horses, you know. Uh, Talk to me about some of your memories and recollection of some of the rides, other rides. Oh, uh, Silver Streak was great. Uh, the Silver Streak, would, uh, it was on a slant. It was much like what they have today up in PNE with, with that goes a cover goes over it. But the Silver Streak didn't. You just kind of went around. Um, there was a Tilt-A-Whirl. Tilt-A-Whirl's a famous ride. We all love the Tilt-A-Whirl, especially when we think we're going to go under the bar. Um, uh, let me see. What else? Oh, the Shoot the Shoot was great. Um, it, was, you went, it was done like a log, and you all got in it. And it was a great one for all the servicemen that used to bring their girlfriends because the girlfriends would get scared and grab onto them, you know, and they'd all get soaked. So the sailors loved that because the sailors are used to getting soaked, right? But it, uh, you, you went up and overlooked the, uh, the whip overlooked the racetrack and the chute, the chute used to look over the racetrack. So if you weren't too scared to look down, you could watch the races at the same time. You got a lot for your 50 cents, let me tell you. So um, I hope there's people out there that remember that. I thank you so much. This is Motorman Elwin here. Oh, good day. How are you? Fine. I'm Adam. Yeah, what, you, what do you have here, Adam? Well, this piece of equipment is a spark transmitter. It's a modern replica of a type of transmitter which was prevalent in radio communications before broadcasting and before it became possible to transmit voice by radio. Uh, the Spark system was used to transmit Morse telegraphy by radio. A Spark transmitter works by virtue of the fact that a spark, a high voltage electrical spark, generates a large amount of radio frequency energy. What the transmitter does is it generates the spark by transforming, say, the mains voltage into a voltage of 10 to 15,000 volts and capturing the radio frequency energy from the spark in a filter consisting of uh, capacitors and coils tuned roughly to the frequency on which the transmitter is intended to operate. The uh, filter is then connected to an antenna. Spark was used on the Titanic because it was the only technology available for producing radio waves at a sufficiently high power to allow them to be heard hundreds or thousands of kilometers away. 
And uh, as soon as the vacuum tube became a commercial possibility, in fact, long before that, when first experiments were made with vacuum tubes, it was realized that continuous wave transmission or CW transmission had a huge advantage over Spark in that it would concentrate all the radio energy on one frequency rather than a fairly broad band, thereby r removing all the issues with interference caused by multiple Spark transmitters operating at the same time. But uh, this transmitter that we have here is a modern replica which has been on, put on the air by a group in Ontario and we hope to get it working at the museum later in the year and um, give an on-air demonstration of it. This is Motorman Elwin here on location in the Meadows here. Who am I speaking to? My name is Gordon. Uh, I, is this a bicycle or what is this called? This is a bicycle. It's an early bicycle from the 1880s. It's called a penny farthing or an ordinary bike. Back in the 1880s, this was the most common bike, so people refer to it as an ordinary. It's got the large front wheel. Front wheels, uh, this one is a 48 inch front wheel and a smaller rear wheel, and it gets the name Penny Farthing from the relationship of the coins in England. The penny was quite large at that time, and the farthing was the smallest amount, and it was a much smaller coin. So the big front wheel was the penny, and the small rear wheel was the farthing. This looks like it's tricky to, uh, to get up on. How do you get onto this bicycle without uh, hurting yourself? Well, there's a bit of skill to this bike, because there's no gears, there's no brakes, and it's direct drive, so you're constantly pedaling. There's a rear step on the back, just above the back wheel that you put your left foot up onto. You give it a few scoots and boost yourself up onto the seat, and away you go. Now, I can ride a regular bicycle, so would there be a bit of a learning curve to learning to, to ride this thing? Yeah, you're quite a bit higher, so your center of gravity is quite a bit up there. And with the large front wheel and that you're sitting right over top of it, the tendency on these bikes is to do a header, which is to go over the handlebars and land head first. Hopefully you don't do that. But uh, back in the 1880s, the roads weren't like we have here today. So they were rough, they were potholed, they were rocky, and you had to pick your route carefully. So if I'm, if I'm, if I'm interested in uh, trying something like this, uh, is there a place that I can go to to rent something like this? Uh, no, you wouldn't be able to rent some of these, but uh, we're here at the museum today doing a uh, little demonstration. So if you want to uh, try it out right now, you could. Uh, maybe I better do that uh, after I finished uh, my stories here. So again, uh, you, your name and the organization. My name is Gordon and I'm from Caps Bicycles. Cap is my dad and he started business in 1932. We're celebrating our 81st year today. We've been riding penny farthing bikes in Burnaby and New West and parades and special events for over 60 years. Well, thank you so much. Nice chatting.